Good morning. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Here in this place, with these people, we come to worship the living God. And you, God. And you, creator of love, we live. Here in this sacred place, in these very moments, we are invited to the table of joy. Here on this day of gentleness and beauty, we are filled with the peace of God. In you, O Spirit, we find our path. In you, teacher of hope, we learn to serve. Will you remain standing and join in our opening hymn? In the congregation, we hum and sing loudly from home. You may be seated. Welcome friends, I'm Pastor Yvonne and welcome to worship here at First Church. We welcome those who are new to our community. This is a place to explore your spirituality and bring your questions. We don't have all the answers, but together we ask the hard questions and confront the troubles and injustices we see in the world. And with God's help, we use our voices and energy to bring change. A couple of housekeeping announcements. Please fill out your check-in and connection card. Uh, for folks here in the sanctuary, it, this will also serve as the contact tracing card. 
Um, so you can fill out the insert in your bulletin or head to firstchurchseattle.org slash live to fill it out electronically. As Peter Javen, the chair of the worship team, announced last Sunday, we are moving to have Holy Communion inside the sanctuary after the call to discipleship. Your pastors are very grateful that we are not standing out outside under this atmospheric rain or whatever it is. So uh, we're really grateful for that change. Uh, for folks at home, if you would like to take part in communion, please have your bread and juice ready, whatever you have on hand, and know that even apart, we come to God's table together. Friends, it has been 602 days since we have heard a soloist in the sanctuary. And today, we get to end that streak. And so thank you for uh, Elizabeth and Tess for sharing your gifts with us today. I'm sure that folks here are just as excited as I am. So friends, let us begin worship by lighting the community candle. Whoever you are, Wherever you find yourself today, may this community be a place of companionship and healing for you. Rich or poor, gay or straight, homeless or housed, young or aging, full of hope or full of questions, there is nothing that can separate us from God's all-embracing love. Christ invites you. Christ invites us to find him today. Let the celebration begin. Oh, oh, oh. 
Well, <laughs> um, thank you. I am actually speechless. That was the first time I think I've heard music sung in the sanctuary. So very grateful for that. Thank you. Um, I would like to invite Michael Scott up here, please. We're very glad to welcome into membership today, Michael Scott, and I'll invite him to introduce himself. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to First Church. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I've attended First Church for several months online and just feels like you know, such a welcoming church and community for you know, exploring one's faith and really identify with the values and, and mission of the church. And, just very excited to, to join. I moved up from Austin, Texas here a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this group here in Seattle. Thank you. Michael, remember your baptism and be thankful. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries. If so, say, I will. I will. As member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend to your love and care, Michael, who we this day receive into membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. Congregation, will you join with me? We rejoice in recognizing you as a member of the United Methodist Church and welcome you as a member of First Church. With you, we renew our vows with you, we renew our vows and uphold them with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witnesses. The God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. Welcome, Michael. As we come together to pray, I want to start by saying a couple of weeks ago, I started a gratitude challenge. And while I haven't kept to the exact schedule and done all the things I'm supposed to do, it has made me much more conscious than usual of how blessed I am and what a good life I have. And I think because of this, for the past several days, I've had a hymn running through my mind. And I would like for us to use that hymn as the beginning of our prayer time. Will you please join your heart with me in prayer? God of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. God of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For the wonder of each hour of the day and of the night, hill and vale and tree and flower, sun and moon and stars of light. For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth, and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild. God of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. For thyself, 
best gift divine to our race so freely given. For that great, great love of thine brings peace on earth and joy in heaven. God of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Yes, God of all, here we are. Once again, we come to you with gratitude in awe of your acceptance and patience and fully aware that we are beloved. We come knowing that we are never alone, that you are the calm surrounding us, entering us, protecting us, no matter how strong the storm. With complete trust, we bring you our fears and sorrows, our mistakes and selfishness, and we know, we know that you will never turn us away. So with all our energy, we promise to serve you. With every breath, we promise to shout our gratitude. God of all, to thee we raise this our hymn of grateful praise. Amen. Will you please join in the prayer response? This morning we will uh, hear two scripture passages, the first one from uh, Ezekiel. And here Ezekiel is talking about false prophets who have watered down or put a plaster over God's message. These false prophets opposed Ezekiel and advocated for a nationalistic hope, giving people a sense of false security that robbed them of their chance to find abundant life in God. And the second scripture reading is from Philippians, and it's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. He is in prison awaiting trial. Paul is worrying about the spiritual life, uh, spiritual health, and life of the young and early churches that he helped start. And so it's surprising that in this short letter to the Philippians, he references joy and rejoicing and peace and thanksgiving. Friends, let us now hear the word of life. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have uttered falsehood and envisioned lies, I am against you, says the Lord God. My hand will be against the prophets who see false visions and utter lying divinations. They shall not be in the council of my people nor be enrolled in the house register of the house of Israel, nor shall they enter the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord God, because in truth 
They have misled my people, saying, Peace, when there is no peace. And because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear whitewash on it. The New Testament reading is from Philippians uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the way, in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Euodia and I urge Sintichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, If there is any excellence and if there is anything worth of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but you had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the word of life. Thanks be to God. Friends, will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Has anyone here done any painting or repainting of a wall? So, by the chuckles, (laughs) you know that before you can even start to paint, you have to prep to paint a wall before you even start to think of opening that can of paint. The wall must be clean of built up dirt and grime. And part of this work is plastering the holes that have popped up over time. When uh, my partner and I were repainting our garage, we spent an entire day cleaning the walls and plastering the holes. We spent the whole day hiding the problem areas so that we could paint over them. Looking at our garage now, you would never know that there are basketball-sized holes still on the wall. So in the Ezekiel passage, when the prophet says, because in truth, because they have misled my people, saying peace, when there is no peace, and because when the people build a wall, these prophets smear whitewash on it. The Hebrew word for whitewash is closer to plaster. 
Ezekiel is talking about the false prophet's messages being like mud plaster that dissolves in a storm. Their messages were futile attempts to bolster the people, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. I mean, we can understand the false prophets trying to plaster the wounds of exile and to try and encourage the Israelites to look at the bright side of life. I think it's like when something unexpected or devastating happens to us or to our loved ones or something that we see on the news and we don't know what to say. So we usually reach for platitudes, right? And Pastor Jeremy shared some with us last Sunday. When bad things happen, what are we supposed to say? Last week, Pastor Jeremy guided us through what we think when something bad happens to us. He reminded us that although we want to search and think for a reason, the journey is ultimately not having all the answers, but trusting that God's presence, that, but trusting God's presence in our lives amidst all the bad and good things that happen. That God is not putting us through trials to prove that we can handle it. But during these fear-filled moments and seasons of uncertainties, how do we respond? What do we say? Or maybe the better question is, what do we not say? According to the Philippians passage, when things do not make sense and peace seems far off, the Apostle Paul instructs us to rejoice and to not worry and to pray tough words to hear, I think. Perhaps the Apostle Paul is not the first to name this. I mean, we have the whole book of Psalms where most of the prayers contain some kind of rejoicing and to trust that God will see us through, right? But wait a second. If we believe that God is not putting us through trials to prove we are faithful, then why Pray. What is the use of prayer if it does not give us the reason why fill in the blank? If there is one thing that I have learned about being a pastor, it is how to scare the living daylights out of someone at church. And that way, and the way to do that is to ask them to pray. Why do we have such a hard time with prayer? Is it because we do not want to get disappointed in the end or thinking that nothing is going to happen anyway, so why pray? I keep reminding us to go back to what Pastor Jeremy said last week, and that is when we are searching for a reason, we must remember that God is journeying with us through it all. We pray so that we can better recognize the presence of God in our lives. Prayer is our connection to God. It is not just a mindfulness challenge or knowledge or making sure everyone knows that we can pray out loud. But prayer is ultimately to be in closer union with God. Prayer can be so personal and raw Right? To begin to pray means a recognition and an acknowledgement that I am not self sufficient. Prayer is a realization that I cannot do all things through me. Thomas Merton, a Trappist monk, mystic, poet, one of Yvonne's favorite theologians, said that prayer is inseparable from humility. Humility makes us realize that the very depths of our being and life are meaningful and real only in so far as they, as they are oriented towards God as their source and their end. Prayer has a long history in our tradition. The Hebrew Bible is basically a written record of people praying to God, folks who plead with God, who cry to God, who get angry at God. The psalmists were really good at this one. 
Deliver me, O God, from my enemies. Give me relief from my suffering. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. How long, O Lord? Give us this day our daily bread. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, famously prayed, God, grant that I may never live to be useless. These are prayers that may be familiar to us. These are prayers that we may be able to relate to. And if there is anything that scripture tells us, it is that different folks pray in different ways. This tells us that we don't have to pray exactly like the person you are sitting next to. You don't have to pray like Barbara prays. There is no right way to pray. There is no you should pray this way. However, know that when you pray, know that that is where God is going to meet you. God meets you where you are. God meets us in our suffering. God meets us in our humility. God meets us in our celebrations and love-filled seasons. And in this union of God and ourselves, prayer becomes an intentional conversation, an intentional part of our relationship with God, a relationship in which, yes, we ask for help, and it is also a relationship where we can listen to God. I remember my spiritual director told me this, that in prayer, I need to hear God. And she assured me that it is not like hearing voices or seeing visions, much to my relief, but it is about paying attention in prayer and in everyday life. It is a mutual relationship of sharing in which I share my life with God and God is sharing God's self in my life and in the world. I think an intimidating aspect about prayer is what happens when whatever I prayed for doesn't happen. If God doesn't answer my prayers, what's the point? Karl Rahner writes sympathetically in the voice of those whose prayers did not work, saying, we prayed and God did not answer. We cried and God remained mute. This question, why are some prayers answered and some aren't? I'm sorry, but I don't know. And I wish, I so wish I knew, because it would be so much easier to know the reason for everything. Do I believe that God answers my prayers exactly how I want it? As much as I want this to be true, that's probably not gonna happen. Do I believe that God answers my prayers? Absolutely. It is like that movie, uh, Bruce Almighty, (laughs) where Bruce, an ordinary man, becomes God. Bruce realizes that he can hear all of the world's prayers in his head, and his ears are constantly filled with voices. In response, he tries to get the prayers organized and puts all of the prayers in a filing cabinet. And immediately, thousands of filing cabinets fill the room. Then, he organizes them into post-its and gets bombarded by small yellow notes. Finally, he decides to organize them through his email. And immediately, his inbox gets over a million messages. This is a humorous take on something that we cannot comprehend, how God hears our prayers. Because I do believe that God hears all of our prayers. We may not get what we want, that's fine, but we trust that God hears us, is with us, and helps us. Kate Bowler in her TED Talk remarked, in a time which Kate Bowler, by the way, um, is the author of Everything Happens for a Reason and Other, 
oh no, I'm, and other lies I've, I've loved. And, um, and her book is, um, is, the, um, is the theme for Pastor Jeremy's and I's sermon uh, series these, uh, these few weeks. And so when she was 35, she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And she writes this. In a time in which I should have felt abandoned by God, I was not reduced to ashes. I felt like I was floating, floating on the love and prayers of all those who hummed around me like worker bees, bringing me notes and socks and flowers and quilts embroidered with words of encouragement. But when they sat beside me, my hand in their hands, my own suffering began to feel like it had revealed to me the suffering of others. I was entering a world of people just like me, people stumbling around in the debris of dreams they thought they were entitled to and plans they didn't realize they had made. It was a feeling of being more connected somehow with other people experiencing the same situation. I found this to be so wise and to me says that prayer can change us. Prayer is a way of life that does not need to be neat or tidy or grammatically correct because most of the time we do not have words, just feelings. At times, there is just nothing there. But if we begin to think of prayer as our way of life, we can allow ourselves some run-on sentences and jumbled thoughts. And this means that there is no need to cover our words. There is no need to cover our hurts. There is no need to cover our lives in plaster, whitewashing our feelings. Sometimes our prayers are in words. Sometimes our prayers are in hymns and music. Sometimes it's reading a prayer someone else has written. Sometimes prayer is sitting with ourselves and God in silence. And sometimes our prayer is lived out in our actions. I always think that the danger with prayer is that we also recognize our responsibility, our part and God's part in whatever we are praying for. When we pray, we are in solidarity with our siblings who pray all over the world. When we offer to pray for a loved one, we affirm and recognize the light and presence of God with them. When we pray, we attempt to enlarge our circle beyond ourselves and recognize God's presence beyond ourselves, beyond our church, beyond the church. Remember this, friends. The desire to pray is in itself a prayer. And sometimes we live out the prayer in our actions and the ways in which we embody God's love in our daily lives. Friends, whatever your prayer looks like, know that it is enough. Amen. Amen, Pastor Yvonne. Um, uh, what I learned from Pastor Yvonne, I'm Pastor Jeremy. Uh, what I learned from Pastor Yvonne is um, uh, is about being about being present. Um, she's constantly teaching me about being present in the moment, being uh, receptive to the Spirit, and being present in prayer is certainly a call for each one of us and a call in our own discipleship ways. Just as our prayers take many forms, being present takes many forms as well. Indeed, there are many ways to be present this week and uh, different opportunities here at First Church. In fact, there are five opportunities over the next five over the over the next seven days um, that I think that um, uh, uh, you'll want to clear your calendar uh, for them. 
three of them are today. Uh, so the first is that there is a, a worship leader training today. So if you've ever wanted to, um, to, uh, uh, to be a worship leader um, who helps with the prayers and the call to worship, or if you've ever wanted to be a scripture reader who helps with, scripture, with reading scripture, uh, we're having a training today just to get people uh, used to what it's like. Um, it's not a prerequisite, um, but it is uh, something that we've been asked uh, to, uh, to facilitate. So that will be at noon today up in room 301. If you don't know where room 301 is, um, ask um, one of the pastors or uh, Barbara or Vi and we'll show you where to go. Um, and so you'll be uh, meeting with some of our worship team and pastors to uh, get a little bit of training on what that is. If you're online, um, there, is a, um, uh, there is a Zoom link that you can participate in from home as well. Uh, second is also today is the Pride and Faith group is meeting um, over at uh, the Queen Anne McMinimans um, that is uh, 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 just real close by um, and so uh, and so that's our our group of folks who um, who celebrate the connections between the church and the LGBTQIA plus community and so um, if you'd like to attend that uh, that'd be great uh, so that's also at noon. Um, and then finally, also today, um, is at 3 o'clock in this space, uh, First Church has entered into a partnership with Seattle Pacific University uh, to host many of their concerts. Um, and, uh, this, and today, at 3 o'clock, um, is a, um, the Orchestra and Wind Ensemble presenting Pride Not Prejudice. Um, and it includes many, if not all, of the composers are uh, members of the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, and indeed, um, and so uh, we celebrate this today, uh, not only because of this new partnership, but also because one of the directors, Christopher Hansen, over there in the back, um, and um, a, um, a, a uh, offer special music uh, through violin uh, many times, is one of their directors. And so we certainly celebrate that. Come back at 3 o'clock uh, for, um, for a great concert here. Um, next week, we have two opportunities. Um, first is that there is a pub theology gathering, uh, a way to be present with one another um, around a common table. And so um, we'll be meeting at the Queen Anne Beer Hall at 1230, um, just uh, really close by, easy walk. And so hopefully you'll be able to uh, make your way over there. Um, the second one doesn't have a slide, um, but I'll invite, um, I'll invite Barbara to come on over and to share a little bit about another opportunity uh, for you after worship. Well, it's really simple. Advent is coming. Um, it will arrive on November 28th as far as our church service is concerned. And so next Sunday is our day to prepare. That means some heavy lifting, hauling things out of the, the storage shed, setting up Christmas trees that we will then decorate in the service uh, next Sunday on the 28th. We'll decorate them, but we have to get them out and up and make it jolly. So, um, so I need lots of help immediately after the service next week. We'll work on maybe bribing you with food, but um, we really need some, some warm bodies to help with uh, getting things ready next Sunday immediately after the church service. Thanks. Uh, last year, our Hanging of the Greens was online and virtual, and so I know we've got two years of pent-up energy uh, for this, um, and so that's quite the celebration. Um, one other way of being present is in being a connectional church um, and in being connected with many other churches in our region. Um, for that, I'll invite, um, we do have an update uh, for us uh, from our bishop that I'll invite um, our SPRC, Staff Parish Relations Committee Chair, uh, Teresa Kennedy, to come up and guide us through. Hello, I'm Teresa Kennedy, chair of SPRC, as Pastor Jeremy just said. Um, and I'm here to share some news from our bishop and our district superintendent, Nakano, um, this morning. So I, I'm going to read from a, a letter we um, received from district superintendent Nakano. Uh, dear members and friends of First United Methodist Church of Seattle, 
I am writing to inform you that Bishop Elaine Stanofsky intends to appoint your associate pastor, Reverend Yvonne Agdiang, as pastor of Redmond United Methodist Church, effective February 1st, uh, 2022. I know this, this information comes as a shock and surprise to you all, especially as this change comes in the middle of the appointment year, uh, rather than our normal and expected timeframes. Please know that this decision is not one that Bishop Elaine and the appointed cabinet came upon lightly, or that we did not fully consider the ramifications of this action upon the people and ministry of Seattle First United Methodist Church. My prayer is that this will help you to see in this situation circumstances that the bishop and cabinet believe required immediate and decisive decision making and action to address a concern of utmost importance to one of your sibling local churches in our Pacific Northwest Conference. In our UMC appointment system, the bishop and cabinet are charged to discern and act with the whole church in mind, um, seeing the needs and concerns of individual churches, but also seeking to keep in view the larger concerns of the greater whole. Reverend Yvonne has served you faithfully, and I know you have come to appreciate her gifts her warm and compassionate spirit, her commitment to justice, and her love for the church and the community. And truly, you have nurtured all of these well and faithfully in her, as Reverend Yvonne has grown in her gifts and skills, um, her vocational identity, and her pastor's heart in her time together with you. I pray that you will have the opportunity and time to express your appreciation for Reverend Yvonne's ministry with you and to bless her as she goes off to this new assignment. I will be working with Reverend Jeremy, your SPRC, and church leadership to help address your ministry needs and concerns in light of this change. Please rest assured that our bishop and cabinet desire the very best for you and for the continued flourishing of your ministry, and we'll do everything we can to support you in this time of transition and change. May God's blessings and peace be with you all, that even in unexpected change, we might know and believe that God is with us and is leading us into the light of a new day. Uh, from Reverend Derek Nakano, our district superintendent. Um, I know this comes as a surprise. Um, I know I've had all the feelings, <laughs> um, starting with sadness for me personally. I won't miss Pastor Yvonne and her presence and leadership here. Um, but I, I mostly feel grateful um, for the time that we've had with Pastor Yvonne and this time we still have with her. We do have three more months with her. Um, I feel grateful, um, and I'm also excited for this opportunity for her. I mean, this is a surprise in the timing. It's not surprising that this kind of change would happen for Pastor Yvonne and for us. It's just a little sooner than we uh, expected. Um, so thank you, Pastor Yvonne. Um, as SPRC, we are committed to supporting Pastor Yvonne in this transition from our community to the Redmond congregation, um, who, is, who is going to experience her uh, and needs to experience her leadership and her gifts. Um, and we are also committed to supporting Pastor Jeremy and the staff as we start the search for a, a new associate pastor. So, um, with that, I just want to say, Pastor Yvonne, thank you so much for your gifts and your leadership. Um, I'm glad we have you around for another few months. Um, and our prayers and our support will be with you um, 
as, as, you, as you go through this transition, and as we do too. may be seated. <laughs> um, friends, know that being your pastor has been a great privilege. And I will be grateful for the ways that you have helped me increase my and grow in my leadership as a pastor. And that I will keep my experience here and the lessons I've learned and the wisdom that I've received from First Church with me to write it. So for that, I am grateful. Um, and you still have three more months uh, with me. And um, I know that I look forward to journeying together with you for these next three months. So. Thank you, um, and this is not goodbye yet. Again, you still have three more months <laughs> of me, so thank you, friends. Church family invite us to a season of being present. Present not only with Yvonne for the next three months, but also present to our own feelings of loss, even as we celebrate another church getting um, a pastor who had a, a crash course in ministry, um, in a pandemic, um, in just such a unique crucible of ministry that is First Church uh, here in downtown Seattle, and one who will carry that First Church way with her um, into the new place. As we receive this, I invite us to center ourselves uh, with prayer, and then we will conclude um, uh, with the Lord's Prayer as projected. Gracious God, in this season of change and transition, as we enter into a season of, um, of, of, of traditions, of emotions, of uh, celebrating uh, the ways in which we're connected with each other, Help us to be present to our own feelings and our own experiences um, the, this day and the days that come, knowing that you're, you are present with us. Um, whether we pray well or not well at all, whether we um, pray incessantly or only when the need arises, we know that you are with us. And you are indeed with us whenever we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer, um, and in which well, we will join now in whatever language is comfortable to us um, or in the words on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We move now into a time of Holy Communion where we gather around the table as one family, both here in person and online. Um, this is the first week of having Holy Communion during the church service. So things are going to be a little bit different today. Um, we will have a, um, the Great Thanksgiving Liturgy, and then um, we will have the, uh, the closing hymn. Uh, during the closing hymn, if you are online at home, you're supposed to be singing so loudly you bother your neighbors, um, but you can also be taking communion yourself if that's um, in front of you. Uh, for us here at the church, we'll be taking communion during that closing hymn as we are humming it ourselves. Um, Pastor Yvonne and I will be here in the middle and we will um, help um, uh, serve you, uh, uh, serve you uh, communion, and then we invite you to take those pieces and then find yourself a spot 
six feet away from other folks, somewhere over here, um, and you can lower your mask for a moment, uh, take your communion elements, and then you can put them uh, over there on the side, piece, uh, side pieces. Um, Vi and Barbara will be present uh, to assist you and guide you if you have any questions during that. Um, and so if we uh, don't get done in time for the uh, communion uh, hymn, in time that the hymn is done, um, uh, uh, Elizabeth will guide us uh, with some piano music as we conclude, and then we will all gather together for the benediction. Is that enough instructions? <laughs> Great. Because we certainly do, um, when you think about instructions, I think about that first uh, Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples, they didn't need to give instructions. They all knew what they were going to do. They were going to gather together, have their Passover meal, and then go on. Everyone knew what the process was, but then Jesus kind of stepped out of that, and Jesus took bread. He raised it up at not the right time. It's not at the right time, and he took bread, and he broke it, and, passed, and blessed it, and broke it, and passed it around, and said, take and eat of this, all of you, for this is the bread of life. Every time you eat of this, you are nourished on your journey. And remember me. And at the end of the supper, Jesus took a cup, raised it up, gave thanks for you, O oh God. And then pass it around and said, take and drink of this, all of you, for this is the cup of blessing given for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink of this. Remember me. So we ask, O oh God, that you pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the bread of life and the quenching cup of blessing poured out for one and for many for the forgiveness of sin. As they nourish us, may they sustain us until we gather around your table again. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table is set. If you're here in the sanctuary, I invite you to come down the middle aisle and then we will guide you along the way. And if you're online, you're welcome to join in the closing hymn um, or take communion yourself. But come, the table is set.
And now I invite you to go forth, knowing that God who created you, Jesus who redeemed you, and the spirit which sustains you is with you at every moment. And may that bring you a sense of peace, peace even in the midst of transition, peace even in the midst of upheaval, peace even in the midst of not feeling present that that is a peace that guides you through all those things. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.